Hi, this is Paul. In anticipation of the Jordan Peterson, Sam Harris conversations, video lexicographer made a little video and asked me how to define truth and if I would talk about how to define truth. And I've been rolling that around in my head for the last day or so and thought I'd make a little video because it actually comes in quite nicely with a lot of the other thoughts that I've been working on. So the career atheist materialists like Sam Harris and, and Matt Dillahunty um, say that truth is that which corresponds to reality. And, and that's, I think, if you would ask most people just their off the top of their head definition of truth, that would come up. And that's not a bad definition of truth. But we should recognize that within that definition of truth are some assumptions. And there are assumptions about what reality is like. And that's exactly why the Dillahunty and Sam Harris and many people embedded within our culture define it that way. And again, just as I think Jordan Peterson is right when he says to Sam Harris and Matt Dillahunty, you're more Christian than you think, Harris and Dillahunty could turn right around and say to Jordan Peterson, you're more materialist than you think. This stuff is embedded into us and it is in us in levels that are not transparent to us. So let's ask some questions. What is reality like? What is the nature of reality? This definition assumes things about reality but doesn't necessarily own up to them. Now, as this other video that was pointed out, I pointed out in my last video um, about Sam Harris and his vision of reality, um, reality is like a pile of fact bricks, or reality is like a bunch of boxes in an Amazon warehouse, and we can break down reality into propositional statements. So, my dog is white, my dog has a nose, my dog is neutered, my dog takes drugs, my dog has four legs, my dog bites, my dog can't hold his liquor. All of these things are true of my dog. My dog is also a sad um, example of human genetic engineering to create animals that are pleasing to us at the biological and health expense of those animals. My dog is a rescue dog, and I've got that dog at the expense of vet. I can't tell you how many times a month. And so, not times a month, but he goes into the vet fairly often because who would design a dog like this? Without human beings, dogs wouldn't exist. And, and so that begins to, we begin to see that this reality is a pile of fact bricks probably isn't the best way to look at reality because there are lots of elements of reality that don't lend themselves willing to this attempt to articulate reality. If you watch Joe Rogan with Firas Zahibi, uh, someone pointed that out a couple of days ago. And watch watch this guy who I, blew me away. Here's this um, mixed you know, MMA fighter who loves to read philosophy and really talks it well and was kind of sending Joe Rogan on a mind trip. And uh, it comes towards the end of the interview, but it was a it was a fascinating conversation to watch. But at one, some point he asked Joe Rogan, what is a knife? And it's like, well, everybody knows what a knife is. Here, here's a knife. We can pick up a knife. Okay. Well, if I take this knife and I melt it down, is it still a knife? Well, no. Well, then what is the knifeness that that a knife has and whereas we can look at a knife and recognize a knife to describe exactly what a knife is well a knife cuts well can't you cut with your fork can't you cut with a cutting torch can't you cut with and on and on and on on one hand you say well pragmatists will will wade in and say well our language is good enough to to use for the most part with things and then the guy says well what's the difference between a knife and a sword and where is the boundary between a knife and a sword um, you see this in Lord of the Rings with the hobbits, of course, because the swords of the hobbits are knives for the, the big people. And so these aren't necessarily easy questions to answer. And, and so this, this position of reality like an Amazon warehouse breaks down. How many knives are there in Amazon's warehouse? Well, that depends on how you define a knife. Well, how many forks? Well, is a spork, a fork, or a spoon? You know, even in the name, we change it. And again, you say, wow, these are things. Yeah, but reality is far more complicating 
complicated than just defining the language terms around knives or swords or when is something a knife and when is something a sword. Um, maybe if you're in prison, you take a fork and you turn it into a knife. I mean, this is this is the kind of stuff we do. So reality, the materialists are or the the definition of reality implied by Sam Harris and Matt Delahunty is something like and uh, reality is like an Amazon warehouse. There's these boxes of facts, and and it depends on how you define knife. Now, what if there's a fire in the warehouse? How many knives will there have been? Will those knives be lost? Will those knives be transformed? You know, will the if 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 a knife in Amazon is no longer sellable, is it still considered a knife? And and so in some ways, Sam Harris has a shopkeeper definition of truth here, that that doesn't scale well, especially to the realm of people and actions. And this is very deeply embedded in Jordan Peterson's complaint about Sam Harris and his definition of truth. And this is part of the reason Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson got stuck on it. Because what you'll see Sam Harris tend to want to do is then hyphenate truth and say, well, okay, there's truth, but then there's metaphorical truth. Okay, but now when you're saying that these other kinds of truths are hyphenated truths, but the Amazon box type truths are, are the real truths, well, now do you notice what you've done? You've set up a hierarchy of truths so that just truth are the Amazon box type truth that we can have propositions about and hyphenated truth, metaphorical truth, mythical truth, story truth. Well, these are truths that are beneath the hierarchy. So even in this move, what they've done is they've created an implicit hierarchy. And, and again, part of what's what a, what a pro what, Part of what the problem is with Sam Harris's shopkeeper notion of truth is that these boxes or bricks don't lend themselves to hierarchies. In to a certain degree, materialism is a very flat system. You might say, well, that which has more power or more mass um, is within a hierarchy, and we're going to talk about how these hierarchies are formed in a minute. But you can see right away, there's a lot of stuff going on beneath the surface in this conversation that it's difficult within the conversation to pause back up and say, now, wait a minute, when you hyphenated my truth, you basically subordinated my truth between your truth. So truth without a hyphen is the top layer truth. And then mythical truth or story truth or metaphorical truth are underneath it. And again, you could hear that in Jordan Peterson's conversation with with Jonathan Peugeot and, and Brett Weinstein. So this, this weakness that, that is implicit in this re definition of reality, this Amazon where, this Amazon box definition of, re of reality, um, is beginning to show. Now let's try this out. Detroit Red was a racist. Now if you type in Detroit Red into your Google search, you'll probably get the Detroit Red Wings. Some of you know who know a little bit of black history might know who I'm talking about when I'm talking about who Detroit Red was. Well, very quickly the question comes on, uh, when was Detroit Red a racist? Hmm, because actually Detroit Red had a number of positions in his life that were pretty important to the history of of race relations in the United States. Here's a truism that gets thrown out. Black people can't be racist. Well, Detroit Red was definitely black. He identified as black and he pretty strongly identified as a racist. And so can black people be racist? Well, I'd say Detroit Red was racist. And in fact, Detroit Red celebrated racism at a certain point in his life. Well, is this true? This black people can't be racist? That's a truism. Is it true? How can we answer the truth question with respect to it? Can we find an Amazon box that that deals with this? Can this um, fact bricklayer way of dealing with reality actually deal with this question? And I would argue that if materialism is the system that you are working you are going to have a lot of problems with questions like these because these kinds of things don't lend themselves to your attempt at dealing with truth in the way that dealing with my dog does. Because Detroit Red is categories of complexity and power, and I would also add glory, greater even 
than my little white dog. So what is your definition of racism? Well, a lot of people, and this is, I think, the most common thing that's going on in our culture, um, is it like the famous definition of pornography? I know it when I see it. Well, that's some one thing for a judge to say, and it's another thing for everyone else to say. Why? Because of a hierarchy. And I would recommend um, Scott Alexander's Against Murderism blog post from, from a year ago. Against, oh, it's from a year ago yesterday? Well, that's kind of cool. From a year ago yesterday against murderism. And he basically says, well, what is racism? Uh, there's the definition by motives, an irrational feeling of hatred towards some race that causes everyone, causes someone to want to hurt or discriminate against them. So there's racism by motive. Well, there's definition by belief. A belief that some race has negative qualities or is inferior, and now we've got an implied hierarchy in there too, especially if, if this is innate or genetic. There's a ton of stuff nested in there. Definition of consequences. Anything whose consequence is harm to minorities or promotion of white supremacy, regardless of whether or not it is intentional. So you can very quickly, using definition three, make an assumption that, okay, well, American America is a white supremacist nation. And so from 2008 to 2016, America had a black president. So a white supremacist nation had a black president. Well, how does that work? Was Barack Obama a racist? Surely he must be if he was on top of the hierarchy in a white supremacist nation. And, and again, you can play with these things. And a lot of people say, well, I know it when I see it. Okay, but usually we can start to push back on it. And now we're actually getting an intuitive sense of what our definition of truth is, which is the overall goal of this vehicle of this vehicle, of this video. Truth is something that when you push on it, it it doesn't cave in. It doesn't implode. It doesn't evaporate. Truth is hard. Truth is durable. Truth is, well, these aren't definitions of truth so much, but we'll get there. Was Adolf Hitler a racist, true or false? Well, can we say? Well, I think, I mean, he's almost an archetypal case of racism. I mean, look at, if you look back at the definitions, motive. Motives are terribly hard to discern in human beings. So what were Adolf Hitler's motives? Well, he wrote quite a bit about it. So probably belief, well, yeah, almost the definition of, of Nazism and this progressivist evolution of race that the Nazis believed in, pretty much definition two. Consequence, yeah, pretty much consequence definition of three, wiping out the Jews and the Slavs and, and others. So Adolf Hitler is about as good a case of a racist as you can get. But now this depends on the truth of your definition. How good are your definitions? of race. And I think these are three pretty good candidates. And again, a pragmatist could weigh in here and say, well, you know, maybe we can't know it fully, but we we know it well enough. And and I think there's something to be said for pragmatism. But again, the definition of truth is important, especially if you have a shopkeeper definition, which again, I don't think that approach to reality holds up very well with these kinds of questions. And you might even go further and ask, is definite, is racism good? Well, ask Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler would say, racism is just the progress of humanity heading towards a brighter future. Nazism was a version of progressivism. Um, Detroit Red. Detroit Red, for periods of his life, thought racism was good. And so he promoted racism and he promoted black nationalism, and so on and so forth. So even if you decide that Adolf Hitler and Detroit Red, at least for certain periods of his life, was a racist, you still haven't, even though your, your definition of racism is hard to define, you still haven't told me whether or not racism is good, and whether or not that's a true statement. So let's look at some another way of looking at this. Let's look at layers of reality. 
Now, a materialist won't deny that there are layers of reality. They just have their own idea about the hierarchy of those layers. The hierarchy of mind is it is dependent upon brain. The hierarchy of consciousness is that it is dependent upon matter. These are all materialist, naturalist assumptions for the relationship between mind and brain or between matter and mind. And these are the reasons, again, if you've been watching my video, Thomas Nagel says this doesn't work. It's got to be given up. And Dennett and Harris and Dawkins will say, no, you can't give it up. It's the only way. Okay, well, this is the conversation we're having. So let's sit down and let's try to exhaust this moment in propositional truths. I'm sitting in my office here in Sacramento, 1390 Florin Road. Um, I'll just I'll just use my cloud of consciousness in front of me. My office is a mess, like it always is. There's a fan blowing on me because it's summer in Sacramento. I'm talking into this computer and I'm using this Logitech trackball and I'm using this boy I should get I should get you know sponsors for this thing I'm using this 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 yet blue yeti mic and I have this poster from my friend oh bucko I forgot about bucko bucko is a lobster and he's made of plastic and he needs to be reinflated so there's bucko he's back where he belongs please stay I'm talking to a plastic lobster, just like Matt Delahunty talks to his. Um, I think, um, uh, Taylor, I think this is your mug you left at church in one of the meetups. And, um, yeah, I can, I can keep going just in terms of the material layer in my office for a long time. And I don't think that's the 20-hour video some of you were looking for. So, so write down a list of your reality bricks or your reality Amazon boxes that exhaust all that there is in one moment within your conscious cloud. Now, you might start, now you, you're going to have the problem right away that, well, what is moment? How long is a moment? Well, I was, the, the longer I work on that, on that list, the longer my moments go. Well, is that one moment? Because my brain is going to be, I've got a noisy, untrained brain. Clearly, Sam Harris, not enough meditation has gone on in this noodle. I'm not sufficiently mentally sorted, so my noisy brain gives me my interrupting myself videos. But write down a list of those reality bricks and Amazon boxes that exhaust all that there is in this one moment within my conscious cloud. You might start with the physical layer, revealing your bias, but your bias here has already colonized the physical. Is your hand writing or typing on a keyboard or is your lips moving and your tongue making noises into this microphone all going out into the physical world? This project has colonized the physical world. I am colonizing the hard drive space on my computer and I'm about to colonize the hard drive space on Google's compute on Google servers and then I'm going to be invading the cache in your smartphones and your PCs and on and on and on and go Paul Vanderclay is about to do this massive colonization project of little, little zero bits and ones brought to you via the AT&T in my house, the AT&T fiber, so glad fiber came, makes it so much better to upload videos. But Google servers are going to be complicit, and AT&T is going to be complicit, and your PCs, and your iPhones, and your Android phones. I'm going to colonize everything, and what's doing it? Well, that's the question we're talking about, isn't it? Well, let's look at it this way. Let's talk about a hierarchy of layers. Uh, the hierarchy is established and recognized by that which colonizes another layer. Now, those of you who have been following my videos know I'm getting this language from C.S. Lewis and his book Miracles. And, and I found this to be about the best word. Now, C.S. Lewis, if you're looking for the best word, C.S. Lewis is not a bad place to look because C.S. Lewis was... He's, he had lots of words. He was good with words, okay? So C.S. Lewis, I think, hits the right word in terms of talking about these layers, that hierarchy established and recognized by which, um, by that which colonizes another layer. Colonizes because one layer employs the power of another to its own end. 
So when, for example, the, the Spanish conquistadors come over to the come over to the Americas and start subjugating the native peoples, they are using the power of the native peoples against themselves. When the European, when the English come over and colonize North America, they exploit the they exploit the divisions and the rivalries between the competing tribes. Well, actually, the Native Americans were doing the exact same things. Why didn't the Native Americans kill them right off the beginning? Because we see potential. We see possibilities. And if you read, for example, the history of the New England colonies, the, the very quickly, and same with Virginia, very quickly the Native Americans saw potential in these new visitors and they were starving half to death and so they could use food to control them so very quickly in that struggle you wanted to know which side was colonizing which side now the native americans actually knew enough of what was behind and what was coming maybe they should have killed them right from the beginning for their own welfare but they didn't know all that but if the actual particular colonists who were coming over who according to john smith would rather starve than work um if they knew that maybe those individuals would not have come over because the vast majority of them would die of starvation or disease very very quickly and on and on and on we go but colonization this idea that lewis presents in miracles is really a helpful one in terms of figuring out the relationship between the layers Lewis uses it in the relationship between rationality and nature. And so I would say this is one example of the interchange between the, na between the layers, and we're going to develop this a little bit more. So let's talk about colonization of the layers. Now, now these layers are not always discrete. They are in many ways semi-permeable, and different things at different moments in time show themselves as colonizing the other or defeating the other. Again, in C.S. Lewis's Miracles, he makes the point that that reason is always colonizing nature, but nature is always, nature can't colonize reason. It can only kill it, okay? But, but they're always in a struggle back and forth, and if one low resolution way to understand technology since the scientific revolution and let's say the internal combustion engine or genetic engineering or the exploitation of of the atom or so on and so on and so on nature kills reason reason colonizes nature but the problem with, with this is we are both nature and reason, and every time we kill nature, we threaten ourselves, which then threatens reason. And so, again, you read C.S. Lewis's Miracle. Back and back we go. He doesn't go into a great deal of detail with this, but that's implicit in the scheme that he is using, and that's the scheme that I am developing here. So let's look at some layers. There's rationality. Now, rationality is, is colonizing the human relational hier hierarchies. Let's say, well, every time you do a clickbait video, you are using reason. Boy, if I say Jordan Peterson, Donald Trump, uh, Michael Eric Dyson, boom, boom, boom. You know, I've just, my reason has just colonized your hierarchies and I get you to click on it. Um, you know, and, and, the internet is full of this. Some some smart person sits down and, and, and has a certain awareness of all of their triggers, and their reason is kind of this part of our brain that steps outside itself and says, hmm, I can use this. And so uses Jordan Peterson's name or Donald Trump's name or, or um, uh, Kanye West's name and then colonizes all of these human hierarchies and this is a game that keeps getting played and it's kind of like spy versus spy like nature and and reason because it's just one of one back and forth back and forth back and forth and that's why these are semi permeable there's there's a lot of interchange and that's where the layer metaphor is 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 limited in this so you've got rationality you've got human relational layers and then that the physical so so when i click on the clickbait i send electrons streaming through the internet and, and Google servers spin up and send me images and that gets into my eye and the eye shapes my brain and so on and so forth. And then once the, it's shaped the physical, it goes back into the human relational. And so these, you can see that there's always movement 
up and down throughout these hierarchies, okay? Let's give an example. Um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Adolf must die. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a famous Christian theologian who was clearly not a pacifist because he conspired in the plot to kill Adolf Hitler because that would be important. I don't know if he did so because Adolf Hitler was a racist, however. Um, maybe it was more because Adolf Hitler was a tyrant and he was destroying um, Bonhoeffer's beloved Christian Germany. And so Bonhoeffer, his rationality says the reasonable thing to do is to kill Hitler. And so he, can, he conspires with others to kill Hitler. So there's the human hierarchy. And of course, there's lots of hierarchies in play. Bonhoeffer is a theologian, so he's adding something to the hierarchy. But maybe someone has expertise in bomb technology. He adds something to the hierarchy. And someone has an inside track and can get the bomb over to where Hitler is meeting. So he has he is participating in the hierarchy. And so, as again, human, human beings and our societies are enormously complex. And actually, the elephants in our brain are, are managing all of this stuff implicitly without thinking while we're doing this on and on and on and on and on and on and on. And so obviously this is a reduction of that, but a reduction for the sake of, of, of explaining and, and hopefully clarifying some relationship. So let's imagine that the bomb plot was successful, which it wasn't, obviously, because well, we'll get into whether or not Hitler died in the bunker in Germany or if he escaped to South America depending on the show that you watch after the greatest show, which is the 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 um the curse of the curse of Oak Island. Greatest show. Anyway. Um a little joke. So imagine the bombing plot was successful. Well now human history is changed in the twentieth century. And so in a sense a cycle develops within the hierarchy because we're always in this in this relationship with nature. We're part of nature, but we have rationality, and back and forth we go, and back and forth we go. I don't think bricks and Amazon boxes is the best way to approach this. This, I think, illuminates some of the relationships between all of this, because I can, I would argue with Jordan Peterson, that the story verse, the story verse colonizes the physical, and the, the physical can kill the story verse, but the physical can't really colonize the story verse in the same way that the story verse and rationality colonizes nature. Now, there's a lot of implicit stuff in there, and go ahead and pick that apart and critique it. You know, that's this is how we make our arguments better. So, here's my truth project, and I ask you to exhaust the moment. Your eye, your hand, your mind, you type, you write. You, you try to analyze everything, first in the physical and then the relational. The, the good people of this church believe in God, and so they have, in 1963, they've constructed this building, and they've, they've given me this office, and they allow me to fill it with my books, and they're not bothered by the fact that it's a mess, and on and on and on and on. Because actually, I don't meet with people in my office. I meet with people out there by the windows. Why? Because we have to worry about accusations and these kinds of things, and so on and so forth. So, this is, this is what we do. But now, so my truth project, that's what I'm working on making this video. I ask you to exhaust the moment. You then colonize nature and, and we colonize the Google servers. And then, but at this moment, your moment was semi colonized by me. Ha 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 ha. I have colonized you. Well, just a little bit because maybe you slipped into refutation mode and no, Vander Clay, why don't you get to the point? All you do on these visit videos is ramble all the time, old man. <laughs> I don't mind colonizing. So, well, we've got battle-hardened stories. It's hard to make up a fairy tale, right? That's what Jordan Peterson says. And these stories are influential. And 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 these Christian stories are old, 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 and and they're really they're they've been the evolution of story according to Jordan Peterson has really refined these suckers into their purest form, and that's the reason there's no the none of you can probably well, if you've listened to my videos you can or if you do a Google search what's the second most produced book in all of human history Chairman Mao's Red Book. Where is that red book? Do you have it? Far and away, the most produced, translated, studied, popular book in all of human history, the Bible. 
nothing even close, okay? So what does that say about it? It says, well, what does it say about it? That's in a sense what Jordan Peterson has been saying. He's been saying, it says a lot about it. If you look at it, you're going to have to come to terms with these stories because these stories are powerful. Well, how do you know that they're powerful? What's your definition of powerful? These stories have colonized human history and they've even colonized Sam Harris's minds in, in ways he's not willing to admit to. And they're going to have a lot of fun talking about that. So you have the, these battle-hardened stories, these highly evolved stories, and they get into the cultural matrix. They get into the story of story verse, and and you watch these videos with your eye, and your brain is plastic, and it gets molded and shaped. And you were taught Sunday school lessons when you were a child, and and these have formed you in ways that you are not transparent to, and you have now a new idea, which remakes you, and on and on and on this goes. Now, we've been talking about the colonization of layers, and I would say, okay, we're getting to a definition of truth. Truth is that which colonizes. Now, think, that about, think about that. Truth is that which colonizes. Christianity takes over the West. Sam Harris is formed by Western values. Sam Harris gets triggered. Physical chemical reaction by Jordan Peterson. Rationality rules debunks Jordan Peterson. There you go. Now, truth is colonizing. Hmm. Hmm. But, but Sam Harris would rightly say, well, well but that's, that's not good enough because that you're just explaining a process that's going on all the time. That's, we don't really know that that's truth. Okay. But let's, let's again remind that you've just used your definition of truth probably because that's your implicit definition of truth. Maybe it hasn't been sufficiently colonized. What happens if, in fact, Jordan Peterson gets sufficiently successful? And this, of course, is the fear of his adversaries and rivals. If he gets sufficiently successful to colonize the civilization, just like, in a sense, the Amazon box definition of truth and reality has already colonized it, just as, in fact, Christianity has colonized the assumptions of, quite frankly, the left and the right, which is why I keep saying the American culture war is really a Christendom civil war because there's Christianity on both sides of the fight because it is so deep into the matrix, all right, as is the Bible. Well, let's be done with a shopkeeper version of reality for a moment, shall we? Because the shopkeepers don't live by it. And, and I think this is just very, they, they don't live by it. They have to keep rejiggering the equation so that free will isn't free will and determinism isn't determinism and on and on. They don't live by it. You can't work a colonization scheme with your idea if you imagine the reality bricks or Amazon boxes are the foundational layer of that reality. The story verse is just way, 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 way too formative and if you didn't believe that, we wouldn't know anything about you because you wouldn't bother participating in it. Even Yuval Harari, who sits there and meditates by his own admission to get rid of any story in his vision, jumps right back into story in order to tell us. Why? If story doesn't matter, stay out of it. You can't stay out of it. Why? Because I can't help but imagine that me is a story and part of and is nested in stories and part of a bigger story. That's how I understand me. Well, maybe I take a psychedelic and I detach my ego from, from my conscious layer. Okay. But even when you tell me the story of that, you've put it in a story and there's a me there. So if you want to get rid of the me, you really have to, in a sense, go all the way over to Hinduism, from some forms of Hinduism and Buddhism and say, me is an illusion and I'm going to spend my life not caring for my children or building my home. Maybe being a naked holy man getting getting alms. These people weren't stupid. They were working out their system, getting alms to at least be able to eat so that I can keep working on my brain to try and divorce me from my being. And if I hit that, then I will dissolve into the great sea of being. And if you're doing that, I'll say, hey, man, you're working your system. But if you're saying, well, I really like Buddhism and I really like that sofa. And I just think, Wait, wait, attachment? Um, and I may have that wrong, so 
no problem. But, but my point is this. We won't call it a religion. That which is your philosophy of life is what you work out. Do you do it poorly? Yes. Do you do it hypocritically? Yes. Always. Me too. I'm a Calvinist. The pleasure of being a Calvinist is that is that when someone says, you're a hypocrite, you say, yeah, I am. It's part of my system. I'm a hypocrite. I'm an idolater. I'm a racist. I'm a sexist. I'm any bad thing you throw at me, I can find it in my heart. It's all in there. Every bit of it. Now, is it as big as it could be? No. Praise God. But also, I haven't had enough life to make everything as bad as it could be. And I'm hemmed in by all of these social structures that have been constructed and formed by Christianity and other ideas from the Greeks. Let's not, you know, say, let's not devolve the rest of history for the sake of Christianity. It's all there. And so here I am, but it's all in me. And, well, I'm done with the shopkeeper version. It doesn't work. Pragmatists pointed that out. What's really key is that you are left living in illusions. But wasn't the whole point of your philosophy to get rid of the illusions? Wasn't the whole point to get rid of the woo-woo? Well, how do you get rid of the woo-woo when you tell me that your whole story and the way you're living is woo-woo? All of life is an illusion. Well, you say, well, I don't want these illusions over here. I don't want those Christian, bigoted, God is not good illusions. Those are horrible illusions. I want these illusions. Like, I have free will, and I can love my child, and I can do good in the world. I'll keep those illusions and not these illusions. They're all woo-woo. They're all illusions. You just said it yourself. Well, maybe you can't help yourself. Objections to colonization. We suspect colonization has a moral problem. Colonization assumes a power to force lower layers to submit. So in other words, when I make a video, if I am so persuasive, if I use Scott Adams, Donald Trump, I'm hypnotizing you right now. You will become a Calvinist. You will join the Christian Reformed Church. You will tithe. You will send money to me on Patreon. You will share this with all your Facebook friends. You will say that Paul Vanderclay is the bomb. If I have those kinds of powers, I could be a problem. Well, look at the complaints about his Hitler. Hing, hing. You know, all these, I don't understand German. I don't know what he's saying, but he's going like this. And I know what this means. So, colonization. There's some morally problematic aspects to that. Colonization assumes a power to force lower layers to submit. This is, of course, technology whose moral nature is, of course, mixed. I shouldn't have used, of course, twice in that sentence. I'm a bad editor, which is why I do so little of it. But, hey, we, all the time, we, so here's Taylor's, I think this is Taylor's mug, and Taylor hasn't been back for a meetup, so I'm, Taylor, when you come back to a meetup, I've got your water cup. But we colonized nature to a high degree to create this really cool um, stainless steel that doesn't rust. It's almost kingdom of God metal where moth and rust does not consume. And, and so, you know, we've, 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 we've figured out how to make plastics. And we have colonized nature to an enormous degree to make this water bottle. But we have done so at a cost. And, and that cost is pollution. And so we try to mitigate that. And then there's, and so this is C.S. Lewis's fight about, about nature and 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 reason but but this is an this is an incredible thing and if you know the gods must be crazy if you ever watch that movie which is a hilarious movie this coke bottle from spot falls falls from the sky and you know the the bushman has to figure out what on earth to do with a coke bottle boy what if he found this i mean this is way better than a coke bottle coke bottle isn't bad trust me if you're a bushman but this sucker whew, wow
So, you know, we've been really successful, but it's a mixed blessing. Colonization uses the power of one layer to impose upon that layer the will of a higher layer. We have used the quality of petroleum products, of iron ore, of of nickel. I don't know what's, I'm not an engineer. I don't know what's in stainless steel. Someone will tell me in the comment section. But we have used the power of nature to make it better, but always at a cost. And, and this is the nature of our technology. Technology is always colonization. Okay. We suspect that dynamic is prone to abuse by moral agents like us. In fact, we know it. The North Koreans have figured out how to employ atomic weapons and not destroy and not destroy with them, but gain advantage by them. Okay. And you might look at the physical layer and say, well, all atomic bombs can do is explode. Yes. But the relational layer is more powerful. And in fact, Kim Jong-un's relational layer colonized the atomic layer and has used it to gain advantage in terms of giving his nation greater status, in terms of trying to find a way out of this prison that he has been put in since the end of the Korea, he and his people have been put in since the end of the Korean War, to hopefully find a path out of the box they are in and use the United States to help get there. So, Kim Jong-un's rationality colonized the relational layer, colonized the atomic layer, and so on and so forth. Now, you could explode that bomb, and then you would destroy a whole other relational layer, and again, the cycle would continue. But let's look at... I'm thirsty. i got to have a drink of water. I'm going to pause. Sacramento is hot, but it's a dry heat. <clears throat> okay, let's look at authority versus colonization. Definition of an author of authority, of uh, authority. I'm a terrible editor. The agents of a lower layer willingly and joyfully submit to an agent of a higher layer. Okay, and if you're interested in reading more about this, Google C.S. Lewis equality and read his essay on equality. And he talks about the specific joy of the inferior, the dog to its master, a child to its parent, a student to its teacher, a hand to your thought. In a sense, well, again, this is formed. When you were an infant, you know, you come out of the womb and what, what do you spend? What do you spend your first few months learning how to colonize your hands? Your elephant is learning how to colonize the hands and the... The, the mind is working and, and you're figuring out the world and you put everything in your mouth and the psychologists have something to talk about and, and on and on we go and we colonize our hand and now my, my hand happily obeys me unless for some extreme reason I would tell my hand touch the white hot surface and burn. Your hand at that point is call, it's submitting to your mind because, you know, well maybe I'm Maybe I'm stuck in the woods and a trap is on my wrist and the, you know, I have to gnaw off my hand and so my mouth and my arm are obeying, you know, so you've got this stuff going on all the time. But for the most part, my hand joyfully obeys my mind even as I make little things like this. This is the specific joy of the inferior. And, and now here in the age of decay in our realm the, sometimes it's it's a tough race between authority and and colony but but we do know the specific joy of the inferior because because actually you know just watch any fandom watch the Jordan Peterson fandom i just you know i just got information about the VIP meetup and then I found okay here's the VIP meetup oh here's the VIP website and this is where you'll get your picture and oh okay they'll take the picture and so then then you have this whole corporation that you can find all of these people who are doing shows with them, including Jordan Peterson, and hundreds of people standing and getting their picture with Jordan Peterson. And well, what's going on there? Well, he's colonized them, and and, and is it Stockholm syndrome? I don't know, but but people are joyfully submitting, and there's a joy to that. 
And and again, for, for many people who aren't Christians, well, why would you go to church and worship? Well, joy. Well, what do you mean joy? Um, you know, think of uh, chariots of fire. When I run, I feel his pleasure. Google that guy. Um, you'll learn something. And then find out where he died and how he died and the effect he had on the others who were locked in that internment camp. Now you get a sense of the power of authority. Now, now the one thing that gets repeated again and again in the Gospels with Jesus is that he taught as one with authority. Well, what does that mean? It means that when, when you recognize authority, you happily submit. Well, why? Because part of you knows that the degree to which you submit, the universe itself will be filled with joy and the right order and goodness and beauty and love. And you know this internally. Well, maybe you're wrong. Sometimes you're wrong. But, but ideally, the difference between authority and, and, and a colony colonization is that okay so authority has layers now many of the layers are non-discrete and semi-permeable um, so you have rationality and I've made this triangle before but extra points who said this and why even the wind and the waves obey him that's authority oops someone's at the door Okay, let's talk truth and morality. A moral truth would be greater than an immoral truth. Authority would be greater than colonization. More moral, more powerful, more beautiful. There's no tyranny cost. Think about what Jordan Peterson has to say about Piaget. Truth, which can only colonize, is of lesser truthiness, okay? I think we all know that there are degrees of truth, that, that some truths are bigger than others, some truths are weaker than others, some truths are more corrupt than others, some truths are more moral and more immoral than others, and the moral truths are greater. Truth is that which ultimately and joyfully stands. Now we're getting towards a definition. I don't know if you're going to like the definition, but we're going to talk about it a little bit. Truth is that which ultimately and joyfully stands. Now, why did I introduce the fourth dimension of time into this? And you'll notice, ultimately has within it time. Materialists will all concede their definition of truth must die a material death given enough time. Well, think about that one. Is that what they're saying or not? Death finally wins in their reality. Well, what is death? Well. If you think about this too long, you might decide that even the categories of death and life in their reality scheme probably don't work because it's just all matter. And so living matter and dead matter, is living matter of greater value than dead matter? Now, once again, with materialists, we're back to their value problem, which I think is a devastating problem. So. It, it's devastating without pragmatism. And I, I think that's part of the reason pragmatism de developed because materialism had such a problem without it that you can only derive value from materialism if you add pragmatism onto it. Well, it's not good in and of itself. It's just better. Well, better why? Better towards what? Now, pragmatism has within it, as materialism does, the problem of telos, of ends. So, better for what? Well, Zyklon B is better for killing Jews. Okay. Better, as Luther said about reason, seems to be kind of like a whore. She'll work for anyone. And, well, here we are. Um, these are the issues that we've been going around with for the last hundred plus years. So when when the universe is cold and dead, will the idea of truth remain without brains to hold it? Can you answer that question? Will math remain? Well, now we're knocking on the door of Platonism. Um, will action remain? 
What's the difference between action and movement? Does action imply motive or intentionality or telos? Again, it's all these issues why Thomas Nagel writes in his book. There's real problems with this scheme that is at this point completely colonized the university. And perhaps some of the problems we're seeing in the university is because of this colonization. Truth, so I'm going to change this again. Truth is that which eternally and joyfully stands. Because here's the thing about time. Well, we have the Big Bang, and we have time going on from there. Okay. Um, but was there time before the Big Bang? <laughs> well, my wife showed up. My beautiful wife just stopped by and gave me the keys to my, to swapped cars with me. She never watches my videos. <laughs> But she, she saw me, she caught me in the act of making my video, and she thought it was delightful. So, anyway, we'll see. Uh, where was I? My wife is very distracting. Uh, truth is that which is eternally and joyfully stands. Was there time before the Big Bang? Well, you might make a pretty good argument, no. Was there truth before the Big Bang? Did math exist before the Big Bang? I use math because... If I say truth, well, that's hard to define. Math, you kind of know what math is. Did that exist before the Big Bang? Now, the poverty of the shopkeeper's reality is once again exposed by this. That that reality is limited in terms of the Big Bang, which they can't explain or account for. And there's no, there's no reason to imagine science can explain or account for the Big Bang. They can, they can maybe talk about what happens after the Big Bang, but this is why Jordan Peterson, when asked, is there a miracle? He says, well, there's at least one. And so could there be more? It's a very reasonable way to look at it. Reality is that which eternally and joyfully stands. I am hypnotizing you. The opposite of truth is lie. Uh, an opposite is lie because all non-truth is opposite of truth and first and or finally yields to truth. What happens in the discovery of trying to work through a lie? You, a lie is something that's covering truth and you, again, these are all metaphors. We're gonna deal with metaphor a little bit later. You, you, you strip things off of the truth to get to the foundation, to get to the bedrock, to get to what's underneath, to get to the center. We have all these words to describe this, okay? Lies obscure, illusions obscure. Truth is what is finally revealed, uncovered. Apocalypse, okay? Apocalypse is Greek for revelation. The last the name of the last book of the Bible is Revelation, singular, not plural. Please, 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 I hear Christians make this mistake all the time. It's Revelation, okay? Not Revelations, not just a series of vision. It's Revelation. The, the lies are pulled off. The truth is revealed. Well, truth is something you can stand upon we say often. We have all this imaginative language to, to talk about the truth, and we all employ the same language when we understand it's, it's just a word picture that gets at it, but we can't live without it, and it's so deeply within us that, well, of course, that gives Jordan Peterson something to talk about. The opposite of truth is lie. Well, it's an opposite of truth. It's an adversary of truth. Everything must yield to truth eventually, ultimately, eternally, and if it is if it is relieved of rebellion joyfully. Okay? When you are looking for the truth and you get rid of all the lie on top of it, you are joyful. Why? Because here is something I cannot doubt. Here is a place to stand. This is what our hearts long for. Why? Even at our peril, we will die for truth. I am, I got to do my sermon a little bit later. Freddie thinks he's coming over to practice in the sanctuary. I'm really concerned about this because he might drive me a little crazy. 
because he probably won't let me get any work done. And I have to get my work done because I should be doing my sermon right now. And if I don't get my sermon done right now, I'll have to do it tomorrow, which is my day off. And I really don't want to, but I really got to make this video. I really want to make this video. Why are we joyful when we find the truth? Why will people die for the truth? So my sermon is about Jehu and and Jehu takes down the house of Ahab and Omri, and it crumbles like a house of cards, similar to the Soviet Union crumbling. And if Kim Jong-un has any sense, he will get out of North Korea before that house of cards collapse, because that which is built on lie cannot ultimately stand. It eventually falls. This is the premise of the implicit progressivism behind what Sam Harris and Matt Dillahunty say, that science is always improving. The premise behind this is that in time, lies are put away, untruth is put away, and truth is revealed. Now, you see some of the bias in progressivism because it doesn't always work this way. Sometimes corruption happens and truth is once again obscured by rust and dead mods. All right. But but this implicit assumption within them, within Sam Harris and Matt Dillahunty, is this, that we're going to keep working on it and it's going to keep getting better and then we will know truth. So if we might definition, def, we might differ on the definition of truth, but we both long for it. So so there's a ground upon which we can have a good conversation and have a good argument and hopefully perfect each other's um, arguments and 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 maybe even despite the fact that I'm a Christian and they're an atheist, we may be partners in seeking the truth. This is something we can do, and and we would and I would I would suggest and suggest to them that try to imagine truth as something all eternal, not just from the Big Bang on. And they might say, Ah, I smell a rat. It's a trap. Yeah, maybe it is, but eternal truth is better than. Big Bang and after truth. Why? Because it's eternal. Duh. That's, that's almost self-evident that it's better. Because we understand that truth can be contextual. Well, if we get to the biggest context, well, now we're getting archetypal. Isn't that kind of the definition of that word, as I've learned it from Jordan Peterson? So this is, this is where we're going with this. Truth is very difficult. Historical truth is very difficult for the shopkeepers. Shopkeeper reality has a terrible time with history because of time and change. It is dependent upon a moment and the absence of minds, seers, and knowers. You can't exhaust a mindful moment without the relational layer. Here's a very famous photograph from not too long ago about a about immigration a conversation that is still very much with us what do you see what do you see here in terms of race what do you see here in terms of culture what do you see here in terms of law what do you see here in terms of force what do you see here in terms of they're in a closet what does that mean what's in the closet what's the police officer wearing what's the expression on the child's face what's the expression on the father's face it's the father relationship with the child what relationship is that where is the mother who should govern united states cuba on and on and on and on i could talk about this moment forever and i will not exhaust it and you will not know this moment unless you are mindful of the relational layers that are governing the bullet in that gun could kill the rationality historically speaking within this frame of the boy and the man, which is why the gun is taken so seriously. But there's a finger on the trigger, and there's a world of relationships and rationality that is governing that finger. The story verse governs the matter verse, okay? Exhaust this moment in history. Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone, all right? Well, you got the physical layer. Let's assume one guy, one gun, Texas School Book Depository. What does it mean to act alone, though? What influences the formation of his character, his politics, his religion, or his anti-religion, his time in the Soviet Union? 
Was his mother a monster and produced a killer? Was his father a monster and produced a killer? Was he abused by his school teacher? And that led him on this path. The materialists determine to say everything did. And, and thoughts are like billiard balls, yet their relational mental content is dependent and exhausted by chemistry. Okay? The definition here of of the hierarchy of status is that which exhausts the other or that which colonizes the other. So if you're a materialist, matter always colonizes. That, again, just doesn't look right because I sure look like I'm colonizing those Google servers. But our knowing this is an illusion. Our thinking that we are colonizing is an, is an illusion. And we don't believe in those because I just got you know, told by Sam Harris in two different videos, I got to give up my, my, my ridiculous religiousness because who would want to believe these lies? What's the difference between a lie and an illusion? They're both lies. This system doesn't work. Which is why they invented pragmatism. Truth is that which eternally and joyfully stands. Truth saw, knows, accounts, and has authority over everything from the start. Truth was there in that moment, but was not contained by that moment. Truth knew the outcome and consequences of every subsequent moment in every layer. Truth is inexhaustible, yet it's, it itself exhausts all that exists on every layer. Now, if you look at these lines, there's a three-letter word that's the opposite of dog that seems to have all of these qualities. Truth is that which eternally and joyfully stands. A human being once said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Think about that sentence and think about the words on this page. Truth is that which eternally and joyfully stands. Objection! Stands is a metaphor. Yeah, it's a pretty big one. Response. If you look closely enough at any attempt to define anything, you'll notice you can't escape it. It's the nature of language. I, listening to this audiobook on Jung, it isn't affordable in Kindle. It's kind of pricey in Kindle, so I'm just listening to the audiobook. And as I go through these chapters, I hear all of this talk about energy and and and. I remember at one of our meetups, James, who, who teaches at a, a community college here as a PhD in, in neuropsychology, James says, you know, the, the metaphors used reflect the state of technology of the time the metaphor was invented. And when I read this Jung book, it's like the whole thing is all one metaphor, Jung and Jung's disciples trying to explain how the universe works. This is the only language we have. Well, it's not the only language we have when we colonize matter. If there's a mind bigger than ours, if there's a truth larger than us who colonizes and, in fact, has authority over the physical universe, it would stand to reason that the physical universe obeys that authority. If you think about the Genesis story, the man and the woman are given authority over the birds of the air and the beasts of the field, and then the man and the woman rebel against the maker of all of that stuff, and all of that stuff rebels against them. Thorns and thistles, pain and pregnancy, the womb, the womb, we, the womb we bells. <laughs> The womb rebels against her owner. Is my womb mine? Is that fetus mine? 
does the father lay claim on the fetus located within the mother that bears half of his genetic material? Well, what about the one to whom all matter is relatable? Well, I don't want anybody to own everything. Why? That would mean I am not my own. We don't like this idea. We might even say, I have a natural tendency to hate God and my neighbor. And those of you who are raised in the Christian Reformed Church know I've been quoting the Heidelberg Catechism. If you look closely enough at any attempt to explain anything, you'll notice you can't escape metaphor. You know, and, and C.S. Lewis makes this point. Well, I don't believe God being like an old man in the sky. I think of God as the force. Well, what have you just done? You've just traded you've just traded anthropocentric metaphors for more sciency metaphors. Is that an accident? Well, I believe in science. Nacho Libre whoosh, baptizes him when they fight when they fight Devil's Caveman. There's a Nacho Libre reference for you. I like stands because it implies relationships, authority, power, physicality, and mind. It is richly multi-layered. Truth is that which eternally and joyfully stands. And I had, I had ultimately stands. I almost reverted back to it because ultimately would give telos. I could say eternally and ultimately, but then I'm, you know, so we're still working on it. Some of you might be smelling the ontological argument here, and for good reasons. The ontological argument is often found to be not terribly persuasive, but even Bertrand Russell noted was horribly difficult to, to disprove. It would be a shame if there was no such thing as truth. And you might say, well, we know little truths. Okay, but every little truth is in some ways gets its idea of truth from a bigger truth. I mean, even Plato, without any revelation from, if I'm speaking as a Christian or a Jew, any revelation from God, Plato could figure this out. So, so each little truth, oh, this little truth is so precious, it's so joyful, I cherish it so much. Well, wouldn't a bigger truth be better than a little truth? Well, here's a truth that's a little bigger. Oh, this brings me more joy. This brings me more pleasure. But, but its truthiness is dependent on something else. A little bigger truth, a little bigger truth, a little bigger truth, until consummation, truth exhausts all. The universe would be better, happier, if there were truth. Believing in truth, now we're going to get a little pragmatic, believing in truth would greatly improve our happiness, our relationships, and our lives. How would not believing in truth change us? You recognize truth, don't you? Or at least you feel that way. At least you have a sense in you that, that desires it deeply. And when in fact, you know, listen to all Jordan Peterson stuff. About the worst thing you can do is keep denying truth that you know. That will destroy you as a human being. That will drive you to nihilism and despair. That is why truth is joyful. Truth, and there's, and, and we want as big a truth as we can, so it's eternal. You recognize truth, don't you? You recognize where this stuff I'm talking about comes from, don't you? So, which reality would you choose to live in? And this is where I always bottom line on this stuff, because here it is. So let's say truth isn't real. Well, that's the sort of Pascal's wager. Well, I would rather live as if truth is real, because if truth isn't real, I don't want to live in that world. Why? Well, a whole host of reasons. Just think about it for a few minutes. You don't want to live in that world. In fact, every time you make an argument with someone, you are pleading for truth. So, if there is no such thing as truth, well, isn't this what all the atheists say? I'll generate my own meaning. Go right ahead. Okay, so I'm generating my own meaning. 
but I know I'm generating my own meaning. So what I really need to do is fool myself and to imagine that the meaning that there is is ontological and existential and more real than me because then I can enjoy the specific pleasure of the inferior. So you might make an argument that you should really go to church because that's essentially what you're doing. But you say, I'm going to church, but I don't really believe it. Or you're going to have to give up that talk if you really want to experience the joy. You're going to have to really believe it. But I don't think it's true. Well, guess what? When you start really believing it, you will think it's true. There's my argument. What is truth? Truth is that which eternally and joyfully stands. There's my answer.